The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Wednesday the 10th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe this hour? Well, inflation is hot. From China to Germany to the United States. Are central banks behind the curve? We're going to find out in a moment when we hear from San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. ITV surges as the UK broadcaster points to record revenue as advertisers pay up for consumer visibility. Adidas, though, takes a step lower as supply chain woes bite and the company warns that disruptions will continue into next year. CEO Casper Rorsted saying there will be shortages as we hit the key holiday season. Equities in Europe are higher, just as you can see, two-tenths of 1%. The euro, though, is lower. The dollar, Alex, very much on the front foot. Yep, and that's very much due to those higher yields. So here in the U.S., very hot inflation, jumping by the most in October uh, since 1990. The number one song on the billboard for that year, Hold On For One More Day by Wilson Phillips. Just so you know, that's where we're at. Okay, S&P, a little bit heavier, down uh, by one-tenth of one percent. Healthcare utilities, no surprise, they're leading the way. But financials also getting a bid, despite the fact that you're seeing the curve there flatten. Uh, you did hit 98 basis points at one point on the 210 spread, but you're seeing a very chunky move all across the curve with higher yields. The five-year uh, break-even up 12 basis points. This is a record high that we've seen for five-year uh, for a break-even. You've also seen the market price in 13 basis points, more hikes by mid-2023. Uh, so all that market really re-rating as that inflation comes in quite hot. Uh, gold continue also to get its bid. Um, you have to wonder if the protection against inflation bid is gold and also Bitcoin. If we're not going to see the $60 move necessarily than we would have seen maybe 10 years ago because now you have Bitcoin, uh, you have something else there uh, to think about as well. So all of that creating quite a bind, uh, I would think, for investors as they try to anticipate how the Fed managed something like this guy. Absolutely. But maybe they're focused elsewhere. Maybe they're focused on what is happening with Rivian today. Uh, if you want to see an huh. example of exuberance, maybe Rivian is it. It was meant to go out of the door at 78. I think current pricing is what, 120? 120. Maybe that's, it. Maybe that's exuberance. I'm not going to say it's irrational exuberance, but it's certainly exuberance. Yep. And you had, uh, and this was a great line uh, that we heard from the um, a Super Return Conference in Berlin. Scott Kleiman of Apollo Global Management said, we're all in a state of collective delusion on deal valuations. What were we all thinking? We'll look, we'll look back in 20 years and ask that question. David Rubenstein is saying something uh, very similar to that. We're just, it's just too hot out there. Absolutely. And the question he was asking is, how will asset prices adjust when we start to see rates going a little bit higher. That is the question that the market is grappling right now. When will rates go higher? Joining us now on Bloomberg Television and Radio is Bloomberg's Mike McKee, who is sitting down with Mary Daly from San Francisco, the Fed president and CEO. Good morning to uh, everyone on Bloomberg Television and Radio worldwide. And I have to point out, this is Mary Daly. She's here. In person, and we're actually sitting down. Some progress being made against the virus. I guess this is a good sign. However, we do have to talk about inflation. Uh, and it's not often you can celebrate economic history. But today is one of those days because given this morning's CPI, we are now looking at a real yield of roughly negative 6%, which is lower than we got in the 1970s. Does that tell you that we have a problem? Well, certainly we have a challenge right now. Inflation is high, higher. It's eye-popping, right? It, and it catches people's attention and it hurts their pocketbooks. The issue, though, is that we still have COVID. And COVID's still an issue globally, and that's affecting supply chains. It's affecting uh, the ability to go out and buy services. It's affecting the ability to meet in person. Where This is my first in-person meeting. And that matters for inflation. It matters for jobs. And so this is a transitory period. That's what we believe. That's what I think when I look out at the data. But it's directly related to COVID. And as quicker we get through COVID, the better off we're going to be as an economy. You go out uh, and talk to people around your district and you say transitory. What kind of look do they give you? Well, they ask me what it means. They actually don't have a, 
a, a hateful response or I don't believe your response, they say, well, what do you mean by that? And I think that's a great question. What do we mean by transitory? Really, what I mean is that not expected to persist at these same rates once COVID is behind us. And that's a very different answer than a number of months and things. I think the other thing that's really important is you have to recognize that even if it lasts only for a year, it's painful, it hurts, right? You pay more for fuel, more for food, more for your housing, rental or purchasing, and it hurts your pocketbook. And that's important for us all to recognize. It's a challenging time, it's a difficult time. With real yields at about negative 6%, you're still really stimulating the economy. Financial conditions get looser all the time. Uh, does this change your calculation for when you might have to raise rates? Well, I think right now it would be premature to start changing our calculations about raising rates. We're certainly data dependent, but really we're still focused on as COVID goes, so goes the economy. And the higher inflation readings certainly have my attention. I'm watching inflation expectations as well. That has my attention. But the other side of this is the number of missing jobs has my attention. The number of women home taking care of children has my attention. The number of people who were displaced and haven't come back, that has my attention. And ultimately, you know, we have a full employment and price stability mandate, and we're trying to balance those things and make sure that we have an economy that is self-sustaining once we get through COVID and really has the legs under it to, to deliver to Americans what they want, which is, you know, price stability, full employment, and the ability to participate in the economy. Well, at the current participation rate, you're pretty much at full employment and the labor market's very tight. What makes you think all those people are going to come back? Well, if you look at what's historically happened, we are always so uh, bearish, really, on labor force participation. I mean, the number of times in my 25-year career as an economist, people have said they'll never come back. No one will ever come back. That's just been wrong. Repeatedly, historically, people come back. Why? Americans want to work. Americans need to work. They need, how are they going to feed their families and take care of themselves? But they also want to, they want to participate. So I'm very bullish on Americans. I think they want to work and get back in. And I also think they're constrained. Right now they're constrained by needing to take care of children. I mean, you know, schools are back in session, but if your child gets exposed to COVID, they shut the classroom down and you're back at home, homeschooling. And so for moms in particular, this has been a hard time, but also people are still afraid for their health. So getting the vaccination rates up, making sure we have safe workplaces that people feel comfortable comfortable in, getting back into our, our lives. I think that's the key. You say now's not the time to talk about uh, raising rates, but policy works with a lag, as we know. And there are a lot of people who think you're going to be behind the curve if you wait till the end of tapering to even consider it. How do you balance those risks? I think the first thing that I want to make sure listeners hear is that we're always considering these things. It's not that we're not thinking about them when we simply put off thinking until we get to that period. So we're always thinking. The issue is that if we do it now, then that could actually be quite premature. And if inflation comes down as we expect it to, moderates, and we still have four million people who are sidelined, then we are gonna leave the economy short of what it could be, short of price stability, short of full employment, and that would be a miss. So there's two sides to this, right? There's a lot of uncertainty before us, and anyone who tells you they know what it's gonna be, either it's gonna be the modal outlook that I have, which is inflation moderates and those people come back, or none of that's happening and inflation will persist and no one will come back, Either view, you should have confidence that you're, you know, you have a modal outlook, but not so much confidence that you want to move policy. Right now, uncertainty requires us to wait and watch with vigilance. Do you think you can move fast enough if it becomes clear that this is not transitory? Absolutely. And, and the issue isn't because we would one day wake up and realize it's not transitory and then we would ratchet rates up. That's always the concern. That's actually not what I ever would expect to happen. The institution, and here I'll speak for the whole institution, we're really committed to delivering on both goals. And we will continue to watch the data, see the dashboard of indicators everyone's watching, and ask ourselves, do we see these inflation numbers looking more persistent, more like they're going to be embedded in the economic dynamics once COVID is behind us, that's what I define persistence as, or do we see them as really reflecting COVID? And if you look at where the goods prices are rising right now, they seem related to two things, supply chain bottlenecks and extreme demand rotated to goods. We're all out purchasing still home gyms, the home theaters, instead of going to the gym and watching movies in the movie theater, not going to restaurants as much. 
So those things matter, and when we rotate back, I expect prices to moderate, I expect supply chains to start to heal as we COVID behind us, and knock on wood, or whatever you like to knock on, we don't get another surge in the virus, either here in the United States or globally. I'm not sure if this table's wood, but we'll knock on we'll it anyway. We'll knock on it anyway. <laughs> I, I'm a, just knock on anything we can, right? We're, We're speak speaking with Mary Daly, the president of the San Francisco Fed. Uh, one of the great uncertainties for Wall Street is you have a policy in place, but the policy was put in place by leadership that may no longer be in place at the beginning of next year. Right now, uh, the choice seems to be for President Biden between reappointing Jay Powell or appointing Lael Brainerd. You've worked with both. Would it change policy depending on which one of them were chair? So here's something that listeners might not know, but I'm, you know, we started out being a economic historians, uh, let's be Fed historians. One of the things, I've worked for four chairs in my tenure at the Fed, and what I see each and every time is that being the chair doesn't change policy, we're, because we're always all committed. Each one of the members of the FOMC, each participant, is committed to the same thing achieving the goals that Congress gave us, price stability and full employment, and then thinking together on how to do that. So each of the people you've named are amazing. There are lots of wonderful people out there who could, who could lead our organization. And most important, though, is that we all are deliberating together, always on the same goals. So the continuity is of the conversation that we have, not of who's chair or not chair. So, so Wall Street shouldn't expect any major changes next year in policy. I think Wall Street's been built to be uncertain and, and worry about things, and I think that's a, a good quality maybe. But right now, I would just want to reassure all listeners, including Wall Street, that the continuity of our policy is based on the conversations we have. And, and we really are an institution that serves the American people through those dual mandates. And that won't change. That's consistent. That's a commitment everybody makes. You're down a governor now. You're going to lose a couple more after the first of the year. You're down two bank presidents. Two more leave at the end of 2022. Is the Fed shorthanded? Are you suffering from not having enough people on board? And would it be a problem to have a lot of inexperienced people? You know, there's two things to this. Of course, we want to have all the positions filled. That's that's really essential. And, and I'm working myself on anything I can do on the presidential searches, et cetera, to help. But the other thing that you'll that I know is that the Fed's built to to rally, and we rallied during the pandemic when we were short staffed because of of COVID, not on, in leadership roles, but in people who do the work every day with us. And we'll rally here. We pick up we pick up the slack, and we work until we get the the positions filled. In terms of experience, I mean, again, you we're, there are many well qualified people who can come in and bring diverse views and bring diverse thoughts, and maybe we'll think about things in a different way than we have thought about them before as we get new people. That's just the way the institution works. I'm very confident that we will uh, be able to incorporate the new people and actually learn from their uh, experience and what they bring to the table. Do you think the banking system is well enough regulated at this point? Uh, and let's expand that to the shadow banking system as well. Well, my intention, if you think about COVID, what was one of the things that we really learned? Banks were well capitalized, be them small banks or large banks, well capitalized and ready to do what we need banks to do when we have a, a crisis or a recession, lend. We need them to lend, and they were ready to do it. They facilitated a lot of lending and growth through the PPP loans and other things. So that was a strength of our um, system, and I think a lot of that came out of Dodd-Frank and other things, what we learned from the financial crisis. But there's a lot of things outside of the banking system that remain unregulated in that way, unsupported, and we need to think about those things. I mean, I uh, wrote a speech earlier this year that said, you know, lender of last resort is what the Fed does. But when you use them regularly, that's actually not a good system. And so we need to really think about how do we make sure all aspects of our financial system are sturdy and ready to do what we need them to do, which is intermediate and lend and, and make money move around in times of, of strength and growth and in times of crisis and recession. We're talking to Mary Daly, San Francisco uh, Fed president. Um, I'm Alex Steele in New York. Mary, thank you so much uh, for giving us so much of your time. Um, I wanted to just mention that there was a statement by President Biden on today's economic news on inflation, saying that reversing inflation is a top priority, particularly in the energy sector. And I'm wondering, it's going to be hard for you guys to do anything about rising gas prices. But is there a possibility of speeding up the tapering? And if so, what's the qualification for that? Well, when you 
mentioned gas prices, you mentioned energy, food, et cetera. Those are related to supply issues, uh, whether they're bottlenecks or just the lack of supply being available. And that really isn't something that the Fed can do. And in fact, if we, we started to tighten financial conditions, you might think that tempers the very investment you need to make in order to get the supply chain righted. So I think it would be very premature to start asking whether we should uh, quicken the taper. The taper's in place. It's been well received. We need to wait and see how this percolates through the economy and what it does to financial conditions. But I definitely applaud any focus we can make as a nation on trying to ease some of these supply pressures we feel, whether they're in energy or the various other things that are um, helping boost inflation in a way that's very uncomfortable for people. Mary, good morning. It's Guy. I'm in London, uh, just down the road from Glasgow where the COP26 summit is wrapping up. Um, Alex mentioned the energy story. Do you think the energy transition is going to be long-term inflationary? What kind of impact do you think it's going to have and how bumpy do you think it will be? Well, it could be bumpy and you're seeing it already, right? The prices for energy rise and we're accustomed to the supply of energy increasing and, and that offsetting that increase. But we're in a transition period right now as we've known was coming and it came a little quicker I think than many thought where companies don't want to invest in older technologies or fossil fuel technologies when they know that green energy is going to be something that their shareholders demand and customers demand that they have so these are transition costs it will be uh, bumpy it it will in the long run you know ease inflation pressures but in the short run not so much um Mary, staying on that and then tying it back to current growth for a second, um, third quarter growth was lower than you and most other analysts had forecast. Do you think that we've simply shifted out the growth and that 2022 will be stronger or has growth peaked, particularly as we are in the middle of this energy transition, as you just said, will wind up squeezing individuals to food prices, energy prices, et cetera? Well, certainly we are, we got a tempering of growth, a, a bump in the road, if you will, on it, on the recovery because of the Delta variant. And I trace all of the low growth readings, the, the poor labor market reports and some of the higher inflation readings to the Delta variant. So as the Delta variant wears off, I expect the economy to regain momentum. But we also have to remember that, you know, people are constrained, supply chains are there, that will temper growth. But also the fiscal support that people got in 21 and 20 is rolling off. And so so that's not going to be the, the boost to the economy that we were, we were seeing before. So these things are making me optimistic about growth, but I'm, I'm not expecting us to see some of the very high readings that we got on uh, earlier this year. I would love to be surprised and see those and, and see people come back into the labor market and COVID be behind us, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if growth is more moderate than we saw earlier this year. Mary, as I say, I'm over here in Europe, and the ECB here in Europe doesn't look like it's going to be changing policy anytime soon. It, it may even become more accommodative. Um, the, the Bank of Japan looks like it's on a similar track as well. Both are going to be significantly behind what the Fed does. Does that limit the Fed's ability to move forward in terms of tightening policy? Do rate differentials matter globally? Well, they matter to the countries that have them, for sure, and they certainly have an effect. They become, you know, tailwinds or headwinds, depending on which way those um, numbers go. But, but no, we would not be constrained. Our policy, we make policy that we think is the best thing for the U.S. economy, the best thing to achieve our goals for the American people, and we're not actually uh, constrained by what other uh, central banks are doing. Of course, we do look at how other central banks are managing their economies and what that means for foreign growth and whether foreign growth is a headwind or a tailwind, as I say. Right now, I expect it to be a bit of a headwind, and that's because other countries haven't been as successful at getting uh, vaccination rates uh, up and in managing the economy as they come out of COVID, which we still, of course, have not come out of. But we have been ahead in that game, but we are working in a global economy, and as goes COVID, so goes the global economy. And, and so we're going to be watching that for sure. I have one last question here. Uh, and it's kind of a two-part question because I want to ask you about infrastructure and what's been going on in Washington. You now have a bill. I know the Fed doesn't take a position on what should be in these bills, but you have an infrastructure bill. Do you think it will add to the inflation issue? And second of all, uh, Senator Manchin says one of the reasons he is reluctant to do additional deficit spending is you're going to raise rates 
and that's going to cost the country a lot more money because we have such big deficits. Can you assure him that isn't a problem? Well, let me start with the question on infrastructure, and let me return to economic history since we started there. So historically, if you look at infrastructure spending, it actually um, takes place. You don't build a bridge overnight. You don't even ramp up to build bridges, roads, broadband, et cetera, overnight. And so that usually takes many years to get in place. And what we see is while that might be temporarily boosting inflation depending on where the economy is, and it's hurt, really hard to predict because we don't know where the economy will be over a course of a number of years, it actually contributes to our productive capacity in the long run, and that's a deflationary trend, not an inflationary trend. So that's really been how we've experienced infrastructure in the past. Roads, bridges, other things, they matter for how productive we are. Now, in terms of, of the senator's uh, comments, it's, you know, it, it, the thing that we know is that we move the interest rate up and down to respond to the economic conditions because our goal is sustainable economic progress, economic growth. We set the foundation. We do that through achieving full employment and price stability. That's our goal. So the interest rate moves up and down to support the overall economy. And when it goes up, then the price of debt is higher. When it goes down, the price of debt is lower. But you know, the average person making a budget for themselves or buying a house, they're smoothing over those transitions and saying, you know, I know that on the, in the long run, interest rates are about their neutral rate. Right now that's around two, two and a half percent. So that's the, the rate you could pencil in and price out anything that you're planning on doing over a number of years. Mary Daly, thank you very much for joining us. San Francisco Fed Bank President. So nice to see so somebody nice. in person. <laughs> so nice. Thank you. Now we'll send it back to you. All right, thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate that, bringing Mary Daly, San Francisco Fed president, uh, to us. Real pleasure. Uh, joining us now for a reaction, uh, Randeep Samel, uh, M&G Investments Portfolio Manager. Uh, Randeep, just your reaction to that conversation. It, it's textbooks, exactly what we would expect at this rate in the recovery. Um, I think COVID has been quite short-lived, thanks very much down to Fed action, ECB action, Bank of England action. Obviously, you know, you never know how much stimulus you're going to need at the time. And I think they threw caution to the wind. They'd never seen a shutdown like this ever before. So let's save off another depression and make sure they do, do the best we can. Yes, obviously, you know, the U.S. has reported inflation figures today. They're a little higher at 6.2%. Supply chain bottlenecks, um, just reopening have caused a lot of that. Some inflation pressures in the system. But I think it's quite right yeah. to show a little bit of caution. They don't want, to show, they don't want policy errors right now. How many more data prints like the one we saw today do you think we need to see for that attitude to change? I think let's wait until we get into next year. Remember, we are now we are, we are still anniversarying very, very low numbers at this stage from what it was this time last year. You know, oil was in the negative territories. Let those kind of cycle out. Let the Christmas rush effectively go. A lot of people are pre-ordering. Businesses are pre-ordering. Households are pre-ordering. All of this is adding to it. Once you get through the Christmas period, once we're anniversary more normalized numbers next year, I think then we can make a more rational decision. So what do you do right now? Like, because that's sort of the macro backdrop, but then you have earnings that are coming in and there's still not a ton of clarity on the supply chain issues. Um, just look at what happened to Adidas uh, in terms of their China sales. Um, how, wh where's your favorite place to go right now in this transitionary period? Well, exactly what you said there to the Fed chair, what do we know an area that's definitely going to be growing over the next decades to come? It's the transition to net zero. You know, this is a huge, huge undertaking that we have taken. Solar, Solar World in Germany had their results today as well, and it's popped 14%. Um, again, you know, the demand for this equipment is going to be vast over the coming years. And strong growth is now pretty much guaranteed from what we've seen in COP. These, num these targets that we've set still are not enough. These are going to be exceptionally good ground for investments over the next few years. Just focus on the companies that have strong IPs, strong assets, strong distribution, that can grow their business models and are quite resilient from here. Yep. There's going to be a lot of money chasing those assets, Randeep. Danger of bubbles forming? There are. I mean, in, in any thematic trend, there's going to be danger of bubbles forming. But I think that the, the important thing about climate is it affects everything we do, the way we eat, the way we live, the way we work, the way we travel. Every company is going to fall into this uh, pretty much very soon. And I think that will open up the investment universe going forward. But focus on the areas of IP. What might look, you know, on a, on a today's PE, very expensive, if you factor in the high growth they're going to see in the coming years and decades, you know, we need to take a more of a long-term view on investing. So 
that's kind of counter from what uh, Scott Kleiman said of the Super Return Conference. He was like, we're going to look back in 20 years and some of these valuations and be like, that was crazy. Um, that means that the Rivian valued at 120 a share makes sense to you? No, not necessarily. Tesla also seems very highly valued to me today as well. But, you know, it, it, it's not just these headline type, you know, these uh, fantastic marketers of businesses. These aren't the only companies that you can buy. The circular economy, the recyclers out there, the people that help you reuse products, these aren't trading very highly and yet are hugely impactful for the environment. Just understand the business that you are looking for. Make sure they have some resilience and there's plenty out there. And you can stay away from the ones you've mentioned today that are very highly priced. In terms of where that leaves the debate, Europe versus the United States, is it a level playing field? In terms of growth? In terms of the opportunity that the energy transition provides, in terms of the fiscal stimulus uh, that is going to be provided out there, Europe has, has competed this year. I can't remember the last time the European equity stepped up and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with US equities. What is, why, is that something that can persist? Yeah, but it, it's very positive to see after a decade of underperformance. European companies have always had a very strong sustainability mindset. You know, if, if the last decade was tech, the US by some distance outcompeted everyone on earth. Maybe the Chinese a little bit were competitors, but nobody else was. They understood digitalization better than anyone else. Thankfully, European companies have a background in sustainability. They're very strong in this area and they are likely to grow very strongly due to this. And these are all global companies that happen to be head quartered in Europe. They have a massive pedigree. And as you say, it could be a level playing field going forward. They just need more of these companies to continue coming out. Randy, great to catch up. Thank you very much indeed for your, uh, your analysis, your instant analysis. Randy Sumel of MG Investments, greatly appreciated. Quick look at where European equities are right now. We're flattish. What we are, though, seeing is quite a big move, particularly at the front end of curves. Uh, that is having a meaningful impact. Tech is down. Some of the consumer stocks are down. Travel and leisure is, is down as well. ITV is really boosting the media sector. It's the leading gaining sector at the moment. ITV helping that sector out. Media up by 1.32%. FTSE outperforming. We'll deal with the details in just a moment. The close is coming up. This is Bloomberg. European equities on the front foot as we come through the close. Uh, we are seeing outperformance from the London market. There are some key company stories today that actually, I think, uh, seem to be having a bigger effect on the markets than maybe you would have initially thought, considering the focus that we've got today on inflation. But let me just kind of walk you around the map and give you an idea of what's going on. The FTSE 100 is up. ITV is a big component of that. The independent broadcaster uh, really posting some very strong uh, numbers today. Carol McCall really delivering in terms of the figures, uh, really sort of, di sort of di making this business uh, much more sort of divergent in the way that it generates revenue, really paying off right now. That's helping out the London market, as are the miners. So the gold miners, and maybe this is the reaction to the inflation story, gold starting to pick up. Alex has been highlighting this, also starting to pick up. So polymetal, names like that doing well. Healthcare also on the front foot as well. The CAC Geralt is absolutely flat. The DAX, a little bit of a drag coming through from Adidas today. Kasper Rochdead uh, talking about what's happening in China, talking about shortages, talking about the fact that Christmas is not going to go that well. So that's the, that's the narrative. Let me show you the sector No, Let me show you the, 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 the line chart first, then we'll get to the sector breakdown. As you can see, we've climbed off our lows mid, mid sort of day. Uh, we're kind of near session highs. And, and, and that is important to note as well. I, I, I bang on about this every day, but we're still at 483. We're getting kind of very small moves at the moment, but nevertheless, we are still very near record highs. Let's take a little look at the sector breakdown. I've kind of given you an idea of what is going on here, but media is up. Uh, there's the, uh, the ITV story. Bottom end of the market, you've got technology. That feels like the rate story. Travel and leisure's down in the mix as well, some of the consumer stocks. So that's the kind of the narrative at the moment. Largely... Actually, I think of a defensive bias coming from the sector story out of Europe. But as I say, individual names, absolutely important. Adidas down by 3.12% today. That supply chain story is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and Adidas is definitely going to feel it. Casper Rorsted talking about the fact you want to shop early, 
because there will be shortages the closer we get to Christmas. ITV, there's that narrative that I was talking about. The stock up by 14.5%. Massive pop for ITV, really helping out the FTSE 100. Credit Agricole, actually some good numbers today. The French bank delivering. The stock, though, down by 1.94%. The, the reason for that, I think uh, some of the outperformance, some of the outperformance uh, has come from a better provisioning picture, and that has certainly helped out. We caught up with Credit Agricole's CFO uh, a little bit earlier on, Jerome Grivet. Uh, he spoke about the earnings, so let's listen to what he had to say. And indeed, as long as the economic prospects continue to be positive, we are going progressively to be able to maybe start to write back some of those provisions. So definitely, I expect that the, the coming quarters will continue to, to, to be well oriented, both uh, uh, from a revenue point of view, but also from a cost of risk point of view. Alex, European banks generally, though, have had a good run. Certainly the numbers that have been generated thus far are positive. Uh, and what he's saying about provisioning and what he's saying about the economic outlook, I think, is interesting. A more positive picture going forward. But Europe economically still, like, it's not generating the kind of inflation we're seeing stateside at the moment. Maybe that's kind of what we're, what we're seeing. It was interesting to hear Mary Daly talking about maybe global growth being something that's going to add as a little, uh, act as a little bit of a break on the U.S., yeah, and, and I feel like that's where Credit Agricole gets a bit interesting because it's less reliant on that investment banking revenue and more yep. definitely on growth and loan growth and that kind and banking and, and traditional banking and that kind of thing. So very much levered to the growth picture despite any volatility uh, within the market. So, you know, yield differentials matter, things like that. Also, catalysts, um, where are we with capital returns in European banks now? Is that still a catalyst to come? Well, it's, it's definitely a catalyst, a catalyst that is current. Um, and I suspect if we get ourselves through the winter and actually the numbers continue to look fairly good economically, then it will be one that will certainly persist. That's one of the standout stories for me today. The other one is definitely ITV. Yeah. Um, this is the, the largest independent broadcaster here in the UK. Obviously, the landscape has changed significantly with the arrival of Netflix, Disney, etc. Uh, but as I just mentioned, the shares absolutely surging today. The company reported earnings that showed revenue the highest in the history of this company, 24% pickup in 2021. Now, I appreciate that the comparisons uh, are very difficult here, uh, but it certainly has beaten the pandemic levels uh, when so many of us were in front of the television. So it's really interesting to see that this is persisting. Joining us now to walk through the numbers, Joe Easton. Joe, the market clearly got caught on the hop by this. Nobody expected these numbers to be as hot as they were. That's right. So it was a really positive report, um, and the key being that advertising um, revenue that you mentioned then. That was driven um, by two things, really. First of all, just with the general um, economic rebound, we do tend to see advertising budgets go up broadly um, with the economy. The second thing, there were some quite big events um, during the period. So you had the football, the Euros bringing people back in. That fell into the reporting period. Also shows like Love Island returning, which were delayed um, during the pandemic. So as you mentioned, the, um, the advertising spend um, or the revenue for the company is actually back to above pre-pandemic mm. levels, which was the key um, benchmark that investors were looking for. On the negative side, um, total viewing time against lockdown, against lockdown comparisons down around 5%, but that's not particularly surprising given, um, as you mentioned... Surprises down by, of, by as little as that, to be honest. Well, exactly, considering we were all sat in front of the TV um, for such a long time. And also, they're seeing some pressure on production costs in terms of staffing, um, which is something we're seeing across industries. But generally, a really positive report for the company. Hey, Joe, for uh, advertising revenue, was it all in traditional TV? Or, like, how much of that came from, say, streaming or anything along those lines? Well, the company's really investing heavily um, in their own uh, streaming platform, the hub, so they're investing in the, the functionality of it and also the content um, on it as well. So the advertising is picking up in terms of the viewing uh, numbers there. That's helping them get um, the online advertising, as you suggest. And also in that space, they're not just competing with Netflix and Disney and companies like that. They're actually selling programs, original content to them. For example, with Netflix, one, Netflix, one of their big hits was uh, Snowpiercer. That was an ITV production. Um, there's been a successful drama recently on the BBC called Vigil. That was made by ITV. So they're not just trying to compete with these big uh, streaming companies and even the UK rivals. They're actually working with them and trying to actually sell content. And it seems to be working uh, based on those numbers today. Consolidation 
Channel 4 could be on the block pretty soon. Would that make sense? Well, ITV have got around half a billion pounds in cash now um, on their books um, and investors are saying, where is this money going to go? Is it going to be the Conservative, give it back to shareholders through dividends, buybacks? Are they going to buy Channel 4 um, and tie up that, which has been the speculated um, thing at the moment? So those are the big questions. ITV itself has always been this perennial takeover target with um, speculation that Liberty, the US firm, um, would take over um, ITV. That hasn't happened, and now I think investors will be asking where they're going to put um, that half a billion pounds of cash that they've announced today. Uh, Joe, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Uh, Joe Easton from Bloomberg joining us there. I still can't believe we didn't get to make fun of Love Island, but I really liked the whole you married someone you didn't meet thing. I, that was my pandemic splurge binge thing. Guy. I'm going to remember that. That is going to be what certainly something again? that is going to be... Lo uh, I, I love, is no love is blind. Love is blind. Love is blind. That was my thing. But I did hear Love Island was pretty good. Or was it lo Love at First Sight? Love at First Sight? Love at First Sight. Is that it? Joe suggests. Whatever. Anyway. This, it sounds like a great show. I can't believe that I've missed it. I, <laughs> it really is. But it's been re, sort of remiss of me. I don't know what on earth I was doing with my time. Um, what are we seeing in the markets right now? We're just closing up here in Europe. Thanks, Joe, by the way. Um, we're, we're just closing up here. Something of a spike during the last couple of minutes of share trading here in L London suddenly seems to have accelerated, hurtled upwards uh, as we come through the close. Uh, 73.40, so really quite a decent pickup in the last couple of minutes of trading. Uh, so certainly some interesting action there. The DAX is now positive, the CAC Iran's just positive as well. Uh, those are the final numbers here in Europe, and uh, it was, uh, it's an interesting chart. Big pickup, last couple of minutes. Uh, I'll try and figure out why. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close. I'm Rishka Gupta and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Roger Ferguson, Apollo Global Management Vice Chairman. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Google has lost its appeal of a $2.8 billion antitrust fine in Europe. The EU General Court issued its ruling today. Google is accused of thwarting smaller shopping search services. The case is the first of three EU court fights in a campaign to rein in Silicon Valley. The UK won't join an alliance of countries fixing a date to phase out oil and gas production. The group is being spearheaded by Denmark and Costa Rica. It's expected to announce as many as 10 to 15 new members today as the climate talks in Glasgow. But the UK says it isn't joining because ending fossil fuel production could cause a cliff edge in energy supply. And a turnaround is starting to take effect at Marks & Spencer's. The British retail chain raised its annual forecast again thanks to strong food sales and a recovery in clothing demand. Marks & Spencer's CEO Steve Rowe warned of rising cost pressures and said there are still those supply chain problems at risk. Global News 24 hours a day on Aeronaut Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thank you so much, Ritika. So at the a Super Return Conference, all we're hearing are calls we're in a bubble, there's too much capital, things are going to end badly. Well, Blue Owl Capital is a disruptive player in the private market and a product of a controversial merger between Owl Rock Capital Partners and Dial Capital Partners. Now, the New York-based firm uh, has about $70 billion in assets. Uh, Bloomberg's Eric Shasker spoke exclusively to its co-founders on why the only way to get their merger done was through a SPAC on Bloomberg's front row. Why do a SPAC? It was the only way to do it because you had a private company, Newberger Berman, that was interested in the idea, but didn't want to trade a unit of its firm for a, a passive private interest in another firm. That wouldn't ever, it, that might get stuck forever. They wanted to know that they had a path to liquidity, and so you had to pull this all off on a single day, and that's what made it complex. You had to combine the, the two entities and list it, and to do so, you really can't do that in a regular way IPO. That takes too much time, leaves the IPO window open for too long. Here's a twist, and, and it's kind of part of how this became its own little, you know, soap opera melodrama you, you referred to before, you know, some of the, the, the stories and the so-called, you know, fights that went on. You know, look, if people really want to see a Wall Street soap opera, they just watch the show Billions, but people like to manufacture <laughs> things too. And, you know, there were elements here that allowed people to craft their own narratives and stories. And the SPAC is part of it because the SPAC 
you know, market has obviously surged and become all the rage. We would have been perfectly happy to do a traditional IPO, but as you know, as my my partner Michael pointed out, we needed to have a mechanic where we could be public and merged on the same day. That's a SPAC, whether that was 10 years ago or in the middle of the SPAC frenzy. Michael Reese, Mark Lipschultz of Blue Owl Cattle, cool name. Speaking exclusively to Eric Schatzka on Bloomberg's front row. It's fascinating the kind of the creativity that is now going into this process, Alex. Um, and I think I, just to take a step back to your first your first sort of comment going into that, there is genuinely a, a real problem for these guys to deal with. You've got a huge amount of dry powder over here. You've got an incredible amount of um, uh, assets that, that in many people's minds are starting to look really quite punchy. But what do you do? How do you tie those two things up? It, it's it's going to be a huge challenge. As we heard, maybe we'll look back in 20 years' time. I think what's going on right now is crazy. Um, but that's where we are right now. That is where we are right now. Also, you know, Goldman Sachs did this great you know, deep dive into SPACs. And this feeds into your point uh, back in September. And they were saying that the trends that they're noticing is that uh, investors might buy the SPAC, but then before the acquisition, they're all dumping their stock. So a lot of these guys yep. say that they raise, say, a billion dollars, uh, but then they actually only get like 300 million with which to spend. And that sort of slows down that M&A market. And there's so much money out there that has to find a deal in a certain amount of time. Um, talk about those valuations. Talk about what kind of deal you're going to have to make. I think that is going to be really interesting to see where we end up, too. I think the people behind the SPAC is also becoming increasingly important. Who are these people? Does the market trust them? Do they understand them? I think that's that, that is that's becoming an increasingly huge factor. It, it is, but it wasn't for a while. There was a period when basically everybody and their dog decided that they could do a SPAC, and it didn't really matter who you were, what your background was, whether the idea was a good one, whether it was not a good idea, whether it was an area that you had a track record in. I, it just seemed like an absolute free-for-all. And I think the market is definitely becoming much more selective. And management teams are increasingly critical in that process, I think. Well, well also, at least in the oil community, that um, SPACs caught on a lot faster and harder uh, right before. I mean, they've been around for a long time. But last couple of years, you've seen a lot of SPACs. And that was all about the name. But a lot of those SPACs didn't wind up working out. They, they didn't produce nope. the goods. I mean, they, they did the merger and everything, but then it actually wasn't that great. And so that kind of put a pall uh, over that uh, as well. Yeah, I, and again, I think we come back to the conversation about kind of does the two-stage process actually really work and deliver value long term. A uh, bit of breaking news coming out uh, after the European close. Daimler is looking at selling all of its stake in Renault. The French producer uh, Daimler to sell around 9.2 million shares in Renault. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the shares react to this because sometimes these overhangs are seen as being negative, i.e. they're an overhang, ultimately the stock will be sold so there'll be more supply, or ultimately this is a message about perception of, of, of the other business. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how, how the European auto sector opens up on the back of this first thing tomorrow morning. We'll get an idea first thing. There'll be some great mm. coverage coming up uh, with Francine and the rest of the team. Anyway, we'll watch for that. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>may not have focused enough on the markets today let's try and correct that and figure out what the biggest movers look like stateside abigail doolittle here with the details well guy our movers today we have a bit of a theme and that is rivian we may not have uh that on the board because of course it's not trading publicly yet for our to, to take a look at but what we do have some of the more recently ipo'd uh and come to market uh stocks and you can see first up toast uh down 15 percent it had soared on its first day of trading back in september but they just reported their quarter a narrower excuse me a wider loss than expected shares getting punished for that restaurant software company and then you can also see 
Bumble and Airbnb um, perhaps down in some sort of sympathy with Toast's first uh, quarter as a publicly traded comp company that stumble. As for some of the electric vehicle companies, let's take a look there too, because we are going to see some green on the screen, no doubt having everything to do with Rivian, which we're obviously waiting for. Tesla up 4.4%, really a reprieve there after the pounding that the stock had had uh, after Elon Musk disclosed that he may be selling uh, a large amount of his stock. And then of course there was Michael Burry of the big short, Alex, as you know, uh, saying that it may not be for the reasons that were talked about but today, a bit of a recovery back above the $1 trillion market cap. And you can see that we have many of the other EV stocks going along with the ride, Alex. All right, Abigail, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Abigail do a little joining us. Let's stay with the EV theme because Rivian's indicated to open at around $120, a price at $78 a share. We spoke with the CEO last hour and asked about the biggest challenges the company's facing. I would say the biggest challenge uh, that we have, and I would say broadly across many industries, um, is, is really the health of the supply chain. And you know, if you think about building a vehicle uh, like this, like our R1T, there's around 2,000 parts that come in from end item parts that come from suppliers. And this is one of those rare situations where a 99.5% is not good enough. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow had that exclusive interview and he joins us now with more. Hey, Ed, first of all, when are we going to see the first trade happen? And what was your biggest takeaway from the interview? Yeah, we're close. I mean, as you said, we're indicated $120 a share. Don't worry, I got the spreadsheet out, the Excel. And if you include options and RSUs, that fully diluted valuation is $116 billion if we do hit $120 a share, market cap $105 billion. Um, you know, what he was talking about there was supply chain. Sources tell me that there's a very clear issue with companies, not just Rivian, but like them. They don't have any buying power because their production volumes are so small, right? They've built 200 vehicles to date, maybe 1,200 by the end of the year. They can't just go to their suppliers cap in hand and say, we need the volumes now because they have bigger fish to fry, bigger customers. Interesting. Um, two things to say. First of all, um, I now know where Ed Ludlow takes his style cues from. So we've, <laughs> we've definitely ascertained that piece oh, of information. Oh, you're not the first person to say that today, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure I'm not, and I'm sure I will not be the last. Uh, the second one is that the, the Rivian is now indicated at 115. So a little bit of a dip off the 120, 125 range uh, that we've seen. Ed, in terms of the Amazon connection here, I keep coming back to it because it feels that this business is basically on the coattails of Amazon. It is, um, right. if Amazon wasn't involved in the way that it would, what kind of a business would we, look at, would we be looking at here? Yeah, I mean, pre-listing, you know, when they filed with the S1, sources told us straight away that the $80 billion valuation they were seeking in August was completely reflective of the fact that Amazon was an investor and that Amazon had placed an order for 100,000 electric delivery vans. You guys heard it in the interview. I asked him, what is it that justifies your valuation? And Scaringe's answer was our differentiated business model. Yes, we have two good, strong consumer products, but we also have a commercial business. And there was a wink wink in that interview, guys. Did you hear it? He said initial order from Amazon, which yeah. I haven't heard him say before. Seems like Amazon could expand that order. That would be huge uh, and maybe justify the price that we're starting to see manifesting itself on the screen at the moment. Ed, it's a good look. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Uh, President Biden set to speak in Baltimore this afternoon, touting the benefits of his $1 trillion infrastructure package passed by Congress last week. What are we going to hear? Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern, is there with the president. Amory, what are we expecting? Well, he's going to come here and really tout that hard infrastructure plan, $17 billion going to port. But when you see the chaos in the port of Los Angeles and port of Long Beach, the port of Baltimore is very much so business as usual. It's stable flow of ports, and actually the flow of goods is less than uh, before pre-pandemic. We're not at the same levels, and part of that has to do with some of the supply chain issues for the goods at this port comes in. So as you can see behind me, it's a row, row ship, row on, row off. Those are for automobiles. And automobiles, we know, uh, is a little still suffering from the pandemic due to a supply chain shortage in the semiconductor shortages out of Asia. And you saw that today in the inflation data. This is part of the reason why you have new vehicles up 1.4% on a monthly basis in terms of prices. So today when the president addresses his art infrastructure and the reason why that was such a win for him, the elephant in the room or on the dock is going to be that inflation figure and the fact that that could potentially be a political grenade 
for his second agenda. Of course, the Build Back Better tax and spending nearly $2 trillion worth. All right, Emery, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Emery Hordern uh, joining us there. Other uh, episode up for me and Guy on TV. Coming up, William Flynn, Amtrak CEO, will be joining Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And Guy and I are headed to the cable. Uh, don't miss that. We're going to break down to all the market themes of the day. DAB Digital Radio, the cable. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.